Writer Lawrence van der Post had always promised to show his granddaughter Emma a real wilderness, something of the vanished Africa that he had known as a boy. The moment arrived last August when he could meet her in Durban and keep his promise. Their destination was the Umfalozi Reserve in the historic heart of Zululand. Durban, our meeting place and starting point. In my lifetime, the city has devoured one of the most beautiful natural settings in Africa and is the main base for exploitation of the land for hundreds of miles around. It's the base also for a remarkable conservationist and close friend, Ian Player. He was to take us to the Black Amphalosi, to which he had given many years of his own life as head ranger in the service of the Natal Parks Board. He is also the founder of the first wilderness school in Africa. Through it, he has resisted what is destructive in cities like Durban all over the world. The grounds of the school are, in fact, a microcosm of the world the school tries to serve. And with bushbuck still grazing within the sound of traffic, it is a vivid reminder of what Durban must have looked like not a century ago. There could be no clearer indication of the future of the continent as a whole if these fragments of nature are not only retained but enlarged all over the new Africa. Today, Durban impinges more and more on original Zulu territory. But our reserve is far to the north of the city and in the heart of present-day Zululand. On the 300-mile journey there, Emma was to see for herself what man had done to the land without the reverence to which it is entitled. Could Emma have a, have a look? Cane on either side, even in my lifetime. And, uh, the bush has been cleared here. And you can imagine what it was like in Charkas of the Zulu day. And all right from Charkas capital and Lindgaard's capital, all the way south to Durban, where we've come from. It was under a natural cover. And it was full of game. Elephant, nostrils, lions, the whole lot. But even in my lifetime, it's changed. You see sugar, sugar factories, and the whole lot. The ironical thing, Emma, is that people coming from abroad, coming from the cities, even South Africans, they see all the sugar cane, and they think they're back in nature. They say, how wonderful, how beautiful, because they've never known anything else. It seemed to me that what we looked at was a picture of such one-sided development that it did not look like progress so much as a form of barbarism. Matuba Tuba, our last Zulu country market before entering the Amphalozi wilderness. How much are this? Just two pieces. The scene of the overgrazed, overburdened, overpopulated earth continues right up to the fence of the reserve, where we enter at once the world of the bush in flower. And there we are joined by Ian Player's fellow ranger, Makubu. 
a Zulu aristocrat. This fence is to be the frontier of our wilderness home, a kind of fortress almost, of the original life of Africa, of which Matkubu was a dedicated keeper. For nearly a generation, the Ian emphasizes that Matkubu was his teacher, his guide, and closest friend. Um, Wait a moment, Matkubu, says Ian. I must explain to the young lady and her grandfather what they must do. Okay. Right, well, we are about to go into the wilderness now, and um, there are some dangerous animals in there, and we, we have to have a drill in the event of meeting them. Two animals are the, the lion and the black rhino, and the drill is simple. In the event of meeting a lion, <coughs> nobody must run. We will simply back away from them and increase the critical distance between ourselves and the, and the lions. In the case of black rhino, we will try to get up a tree if there's time, but if there's no time, we will get behind a tree. And the third, and perhaps the most important point to remember, is that Makubu is going to walk in front and at all times make sure that he is in front of you. I will walk directly behind him, then you, Emma, and then you, Colonel. We will cross the Black Mfolozi and go to Ngocheni, which is our first camp, where we have sleeping bags and cutlery, <coughs> etc. And we will stay the first night there. And last but not least, one of the harshest sounds in the wilderness is the sound of a human voice. So let's try and keep quiet. If you want to attract my attention or Makubu's attention, all you do is to make a noise like this. Just go, shk and uh, you'll probably see our heads jerked off our shoulders. Right, Makubu, Asihamba. OK. The wilderness is not benign, nor is it red in tooth and claw. I feel that it is impartial, because if you make a mistake, and if you do not know what you are doing, if you do not look carefully, uh, you can get yourself into a situation very quickly uh, where you could be killed. The world beyond the fence fell away from us. Ian's exhortation to silence immediately bore fruit. A remarkable animal procession joined us. A ritualistic file of wildebeest and zebra who often pool the senses in which they specialize, the zebra's keenness of sight, the wildebeest's sensitivity of hearing. And they do this to defend themselves against the lion and leopard. And they passed us like a band of pilgrims on their way to some sacred water. And then suddenly, we find ourselves walking into our first rhino, Judging by the rhino's behavior, it had seemed for one awful moment to Ian, Matkubu, and I, as if we were going to be charged. He's still standing just there. Just come behind a tree here. Come behind a tree. It's a white one there. It's not a black one. Why was he so aggressive yesterday? I think they were just frightened, ran off. Mm. It came out there like a flat. The younger they are, the, um, the more the more risky it is. The more they'll experience what takes more against them. It was amazing how quickly the bush emptied, and we could go down unescorted to the black Amphalosi. Oh. 
I had never seen the country so dry and the great river so low, even for the end of the dry season. by one of those splendid sycamore fig trees in which the Amphidosi specializes, we prepare to cross the river. Innocent and serene as it all looked, we chose the crossing with great care. It is always advisable to make sure that you cross where the water is no deeper than about a foot, because the crocodiles can uh, hide in as much as 18 inches of water. One of the things that I always try to do before we set out on a trail is to tell people uh, to be afraid is uh, not cowardice, uh, that it's very important to be afraid. But it is equally important not to be too afraid, because if you are, then you are missing out on much that is going around you. Oh, there's a leopard with a Ningwe. Ingwe Makubu confirmed it was a leopard, and the thought made him press on instantly. We made our sight later than we normally think wise. The sun sets quickly in a Zululand winter, and there was little light left to prepare a camp particularly a first camp before the dark. Well, right. Adrian, how would you like us to...? Well, if you could uh, just get the, the spade and the kettle, and then uh, we need some firewood okay. to oh. make the fire. Yeah. Okay, Maku. Cool. Yeah. Okay. 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 There's always Makubu and Yan to care in clearing the site in order to make certain that there were no snakes, scorpions, spiders, or other unpleasant things concealed in the leaves and grass, as well as ensuring that our fire wouldn't set the bush alight. Well, Emma, we're going to have to keep watch now, and you're going to keep the first watch. Uh, there are two points that I'd like to make. The first is that you have all our lives in your hands now, and you've got to make sure that you stay awake. Uh, just keep moving now and again, uh, so that you throw a shadow or some, if anything comes like a black rhino or a lion, and uh, they'll know that there are people here. So all you've got to do, if anything happens, if you hear anything unusual or you see anything, shine the torch, and if it's something dangerous, well, then you you wake me quickly, all right? Or okay. Anne Makubu and I and the Colonel will get up. Uh, if things really get bad, you must just get up the tree here. OK. The second thing is that uh, this is an opportunity for someone like yourself to really be alone and there are not many places left in the world now where you can sit by yourself and be alone. And that's one of the real uh, values of this, of this wilderness area. And it's part of our teaching uh, to let people have that little time alone because we feel that the spiritual impact of wilderness is just as important, if not more so, than the physical side that we've experienced today. So, we leave you now. Let's go to bed, shall we, Colonel? Yeah. Good night, Dan. Good night.
Oh, that's not cool. Yeah. It's all Lala, manje. Yeah. 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 We were not surprised at dawn to see the vultures gathering, the birds of the king, as the Zulus called them, because these birds followed Chaka, their terrible emperor, wherever he went to hunt and to kill in this very area. Not a hundred yards from the camp, the cause of the unease of the night was plain, a splash of baboon blood and cat marks beside it. It's it very badly. Mm -hmm. That was the one that the, the, the leopard caught in the night. Yeah. So it's torn into it. He says it's badly, badly injured. And then it ran away. It ran away. Reading this diary of the night, written by the paws, the hooves and feet of the animals who had passed our camp in the night, is one of the oldest hunter's rituals imposed on all who follow in their tracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It goes along here, you see? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it's a black rhino that's uh, defecated there last night and then scratched its tongue. We all became conscious now that we were in a world where some animal eye or other sense was constantly upon us. And unless we took this into our reckoning, then the closeness to the animals which we sought would evade us. In stages, Ian and Mkubu took us closer and closer to the game. Impala, a superb Nyala bull, more Impala. From the river bank, we could see wildebeest, obviously very thirsty, hastening towards the water. Emma, like most of us, was astonished to learn that they were more akin to antelope than buffalo. They drank with a delicacy as great as their watchfulness for crocodile in front and possible predators behind. Their reflections dazzling the black Amphalosi water. A copybook zebra family, complete with a long legged foe, joined the multitude while we were watching from a new observatory in the shade. Refreshed with Amphalosi water, the wildebeest became lively and even playful in their going. One old male sharpening his horns and rolling in the sand to free himself of parasites. So silent were we that a warthog moved unafraid straight towards us out of the bush at our backs.
The warthog was even more disbelieving than we were when at last he sensed us. His tail shot up and he tore off. We could have stayed there all day but the wind changed and warned the sensitive animal noses of our presence and sent them hurrying away into the bush. It's a sobering thought that animals prefer the stink of a pole cat to the scent of a man. Well, even I have been staggered, you know, in the short time we've been here. I have charged this tiny little pocket handkerchief of a wilderness is with game. And what a fantastic variety. And people have often asked me, well, how is it that so small an area can produce so great a variety? And of course, the answer is that it wasn't produced by this area. It was produced by Africa. Because even when I was a boy, this was linked to the greater Africa. And the importance of that is that never in the zoological history of this world. As far as we know, has there been a continent so charged with natural life? The largest part of Africa was dominated by a little Aboriginal man who lived entirely a hunter's relationship. And he lived entirely dependent on game. And like the game, he kept to the proportions of the natural situation. But the whole thing was still manageable from nature's point of view mm. until we started moving in from the south. And then the slaughter really began. You know, you've got the evidence in your own family records of how awful this killing was even in the 30s of the last century. Because your great-grandfather told me as a little boy, and it made an enormous impression on me, on how he is a boy taking part in the great trek, the great covered wagon movement into the interior, rode out on patrol with his own father. And that wherever they looked, day after day, they were horrified to see the felt littered with bones. And you know, even in the 50s of the last century, there was a very infamous Afrikaans hunter who had a place I know very well in the Kalahari Desert. One Sunday afternoon, it's ironic, a Sunday afternoon, drove 300 elephants into a swamp so they couldn't get out and then spent a week shooting them all just oh in order God. to get their tusks away. And this is still going on today. So you can see how precious it makes all this to us. Yeah. Continuing our way down river, Matkubu, in his fearless way, wanted to lead straight through a stand of tangled reeds. But Ian would have none of it. Really dangerous. Well, sometimes you have no option but to get into situations, um, say along a river bank, where you are going to walk through dense reeds, uh, where of course it can be dangerous. I have found that in these situations, I then rely on my intuition. If I have a feeling that it is dangerous in one particular place or another, where the reeds are too thick or there's just something that warns you not to do it, then I don't go. I will rather get into the river and walk up the river. Avoid 
Once past the reeds, we recrossed the river and climbed the bank again. And there in the open was what we would have walked into had we gone through the reeds. Luckily, we were downwind and a clear view ahead of us allowed us to approach. affinity with them and although some people consider them ugly I thought they were extraordinarily beautiful in fact I still do think that I have got a tremendous love and respect for them they are gentlemen we found ourselves on the move again through Makubus, ancestral land. And over and over again, he would stop to uncover for us evidence of how, just beneath the surface, his people for centuries had been involved in the life of the wilderness. He brings a perfect domestic grinding stone out of the soil and shows us how countless Zulu women in the past used it for making meal out of corn. And some of the legendary Zulu blacksmiths and makers of great spears, he emphasized, had their forges here and almost immediately showed us the site of an ancient Zulu smithy. This is an old forge. This is the uh, the iron stand. What do you call it when it's uh, fused with slag? Slag. That's a slag. Yeah. yeah. And there is the uh, where the bellows used to go in. But what mattered most to Matkubu is that growing everywhere throughout the Black Amphalosi area was the most sacred of all the trees, the Impafa. <laughs> Lape 
It is, he said, their tree of everlasting life, because at any time in the year, it has green leaves, yellowing leaves, all the cycles of growth always on it. As we could see from the chewed off ends of the branches, it was a most important tree in the life of the animals and even of his people as food in times of need. But far more important is its role as food for the spirit. He took a branch and told us it is to the tree what an individual is to life. He showed Emma how the upper thorn points forward and the bottom curves backwards, so illustrating two great fundamentals of Zulu faith, that the life of the individual is an obligation to thrust forward into the future without ever losing a hold on what is good in the past. But Kubo spoke directly to Emma, calling her Ankozanyana, which means really little princess, in what Ian always calls Matkubu's Shakespearean Zulu. <laughs> From this tree of trees, Matkubu took us on the track of the animal, which plays perhaps the greatest role of all in the Zulu's belief as another keeper of the spirit of their ancestors, the buffalo. This presented Ian with an acute problem. The buffalo is one of the three most dangerous animals of Africa. And Ian warned us that it is as intelligent as it is fearless and aggressive, because it possesses a formidable combination of senses. Okay, mala, 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 mala. We're just gonna be careful. Because black... We were not to be confused by the fact that he lay there fast asleep with his own residential egret in attendance to clean him of ticks and parasites. Okay. All right. The great old bull, deliberately on the commanding height, at once proved how right Ian was to warn us. Although we were approaching with the utmost care and still at some distance, something so slight that we were unaware of it had brought him out of his sleep. Sadly, we watched him taking his herd away. But almost at our feet, Matkubu found something else to relieve our disappointment. Well, that's a, a scorpion's hole. La pula la co. Okay. Look at me. Tati me. Okay. You're going to take him out? Yeah. Now, the scorpion has its role in nature as well. It uh, is a predator, catches termites, moths, insects, and then itself is prey to things like the animals like the baboon. Makubu okay. found the scorpion's larder first mm -hmm. and extracted a grub set by for the scorpion's feed. Evil. You see him, Emma? Oh, goodness me, he looks evil. No, he's not evil. He's, he's not evil. No, he's mm. not evil, but he looks ready to do imagine damage. What, imagine what we look like to him. Yeah. Mm. Look at those great claws. Thanks. I've 
front. And then the red bit on the tail, is that the poison? Yep. Yeah, and a lot. And fizzle. So he uses his claws to catch the... Um, to catch the prey. Catch the prey, the insects. And, mm. yeah. So we came to one of the oldest black Amphilosi tracks, part of the ancient African system of highways made from the Cape to Cairo by those great civil engineers of the wilderness, the hippo, the rhino, and the elephant. The sort of track which formed the basis for the first man-made roads, a symbol, Ian is fond of saying, of the way man and nature must cooperate in the future. By our fire at night, when one is alone, but never lonely in the wilderness, I remembered Makubu saying to me once, the wood burns out, but the fire goes on forever. We die, but others come to take our place. Emma, Emma, I'm afraid it's time to get our blood. I can hear the sound of animals, and you realize that whereas human beings might be thinking of going to sleep, the whole rest of the bush is alert and awake, um, avoiding predators or else preying on other animals. After there's been a particularly loud series of noises, things calm down because the other animals can feel a sense of security. You know, I think of people who, who, who were born in India, like like my mother and my grandfather. You know, the only education they had um, was this sort of thing and the Bible. They had nothing else. I keep on thinking of Mkubu because he's much nearer to that lot, you know, but that uh, his yeah. people massacred. Yeah. You know, they massacred your great grandmother. Then uh, we conquered his people. 
then they re-established him. Then Ian's family came from, from England. His great-grandfather fought like mad against Macrupo's people. Mm -hmm. And then against... I fought like mad. We fought like mad against Ian and his yeah. people. And then here, yeah, all three of us meet. And I mean, it's... Uh, we have found something really that it makes it all that quarreling and things so silly in the past. Well, we exactly, find something yeah. that unites us. The Amphilosi area is now so crowded with animals. The problem in this reserve is to keep a balance and to prevent one species from dominating another. It was a striking revelation of our new paradoxical role that we had reached a point where the wilderness cried out to us to help it in managing itself. It was most noticeable how Makubu now had no difficulty in passing on all this to Emma without any need of interpretation. And so can they smell us? Yeah, yeah, in all the other form. Oh, there they go. Do they smell the inguenia? The inguenia, the zimbeli manj. It's tattoo. It's in shone manzi. Oh, one's gone? Yeah. Ah, oh, I yeah. see. So there were three. But Kubo was telling her that the animals before her had just fled because of the crocodile and Gweni. Watch, watch, watch. There you are. There you are. Oh my God! Yeah. The ant man's throwing up sand all around. Yeah, no, no. Ah. yeah you see, you know, see how they kick, kick the sand yeah. out. You see his tiny little pinches there. Yeah. You can just see where his little head's mm. coming out. Go on. He's really struggling. Go on, idiot. Now you see, this is this illustrates very clearly how all over the earth there <laughs> that we've been walking, there are these little ant lion pits, predators and prey. Always the story of predators and prey wherever you go. Yeah. Now there's a great drama there, a great, great drama taking place there. Is that his leg that's got there? Come on. Oh, I see he's kicking out the sand yeah. again. Now the ant is nearly getting away. Because he's being blinded by the sand, so that's he can't right. see his way out. That's right, that's right. It even looks like an arena. Yes, it does, it does. Yes, he's got his nose thrown sand all over the head as well. So he's, so he can't he's see confused now, he's confused, but he's strong. That's a very strong ant there. Mm. Oh, it's really incredible the way that you can see it happening on that scale with the ant and the ant lion. And then you see it, the jackal almost catching the inyala, the young inyala. And then at night you hear the lions. I mean, it happens the whole way through. The only predator who always succeeds is man. Well, I wouldn't be too sure about that either. Yeah, it's true that we sit at the top of the tree. Um, and yet, well, I have a strong feeling that the insects are the yeah, ones that are going gone. to win in the end.
We moved on from there and came to a valley. On the far side, in the way we had to go, a huge white rhino lay fast asleep. He lay in a dried out wallow, excavated by Zulu women a hundred years before, in order to get clay for the walls of their huts. As sleeping rhinos are even more dangerous than sleeping dogs, we prepared to pass him by as quietly as we could. The snap of a twig brought him alert to his feet and ready to charge. There were no trees for us to climb or hide behind. All we could do was to stand still and immovable and watch him trying to decide what to do. There was no wind and he couldn't smell us. Close as we were, his eyesight was too poor until there came a moment when a blur of something strange forced itself upon his eyes and his best sense, that of smell, caught a whiff of us. That was enough to send him off downwind, fortunately, to the valley, where he was joined by an adolescent we had not even seen. It was our closest encounter with a rhino yet, a mere 21 feet had separated us. And the relief made us laugh and joke as we walked on. We saw our first Nombeya tree in full bloom. The great heart, Matkubus people call it. On the way out, we had our last rest uh, by some ground orchids Emma wanted to draw. So this was called the, the um, flower, and Zulu is called the food of the Swampy, which is the smallest Franklin. The Franklin is Africa's equivalent of a partridge. <laughs> he says when it calls like that, then you know that it's going to rain. That's when the rain is coming. Yeah, naturally has a great and a most infectious laugh. But I've never heard it so uninhibited and pure as on this last afternoon. It seemed to me to celebrate not just a private joke between him and Matkubu, but to be an expression of the joy of rediscovery of our natural selves, which is the wilderness's great gift to us. <laughs> 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 You'll never live that down, man. <laughs> <laughs>